do your PhD at SOAS, what, um, what facilities you have open to you, what subject areas we offer you within our PhD programmes, um, and so on and so forth. And then I'm actually going to talk um, in more detail about how you actually apply um, to a PhD programme and what we're looking for when we're looking at the PhD applications. Um, and then also give you a good timeline for what that looks like, talk about some funding options, um, and then, as I say, we'll open up for questions for you. So in terms of why you might want to think about studying at SOAS University of London for your PhD is we are located in the heart of London. We're a global top 50 um, university for the arts and humanities. We have world-class facilities, leading academics who are practitioners in the field, small class sizes and what that means for you as a PhD student is one, we do limit how many PhD students our supervisors can take on in any given year. Um, so that means that you know that you're going to have dedicated time with your supervisor. Um, and also in terms of classes, as a PhD student, you don't formally take classes um, in that you wouldn't have um, like a weekly um, lecture and seminar each week that pertains to your PhD because it's a research piece. However, um, in the first couple of weeks that you're with us, your supervisor will go through your particular um, piece of research and they will talk to you about classes that we do have modules within our um, postgraduate taught programs that they think are relevant to you and that you then might want to audit. So they do kind of um, allow you to do that. And that's where, again, these small class sizes come into effect. We also have very flexible and interdisciplinary degrees, which again plays into that same aspect of if you are doing a piece of research that happens to fall over a few different departments, you will have a main supervisor who is there to um, help you throughout your time. But it may be that you also interact with a number of our other academics um, in different departments um, or in different research centres that are still pivotal to your particular piece of research. And again, with the classes that they recommend for you, it doesn't always have to be within the department in which you're taking your um, PhD um, in. It could be a related um, degree. And with SOAS, we do believe that all of our areas are interrelated and interconnected with each other. Um, and that's kind of uh, one of the benefits of coming to a smaller, more focused, more specialised um, university. And then we do have a very diverse and international student population, which also feeds into your experience at SOAS. In terms of why you might want to think about studying your PhD at SOAS, again, there's um, a lot that we offer you um, in terms of um, your studies. And at SOAS, we don't just see you as a PhD student who's coming in to do a particular piece of research. We see you as joining um, our, our research community um, and also a research community that's across the world and um, that you will play a vital role in developing a vibrant and intellectual culture. And from that, you will also benefit from world-class facilities. And we've listed the main ones here for you. So we do have a very comprehensive program of research training and skills development. It's fully recognized by the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, we have a highly experienced and active research staff who will be your supervisors, and they will be doing their own research alongside that as well. Uh, we have an integrated training program and a dedicated careers advisory service, which is accessible for all of our students, especially our research students. We have research partnerships with Chase and the Bloomsbury Postgraduate Skills Network, which enables you to access training at other institutions and build your research networks. We have opportunities for you to publish your work through our student-led journal. Um, and this will also allow you some opportunities for funding to present your work at conferences, and complete a period of overseas field work if you um, want to do that and of course if that's pivotal to your piece of research. We also have access to the outstanding um, SOAS library which is one of five research libraries um, within the UK and also um, the Research Student, Associa uh, Student Association which is a highly active community of research students who organise a lot of social and academic events and who also advocate for the needs of research students. In terms of which subject areas we cover, we do have quite a vast range. They are all in the social sciences and the humanities. I won't go through them all here, but we've listed them all for you to have a look at. And as we say, we normally have a number of students who might be doing a um, research degree across a few different areas. For instance, we have our um, Centre for Migration and Diaspora Studies, which is actually a centre which is made up of um, 
the anthropology and sociology department and also the development studies department and also has some links to the economics department um, and gender studies. So as you'll see, there are lots of things that come into play and it might be um, that you are actually doing a piece of research that goes across a number of different departments. And all of these um, areas will have research within them. Um, it's a case of having a look through, seeing what our particular department kind of areas of specialism are, looking at who the academic staff are, looking at what they teach on, um, what they've um, published themselves, and also possibly other work that they've done in and around academia, because a number of our staff um, are actually practitioners in the field as well. So as well as teaching on academic programmes, they also hold other um, posts, such as working on various different policy panels, um, working with various different governments. So it's important to have a look at who the academic staff are and what their focus is in, within the department. In terms of the research training provision, um, we do, as I say, offer a very, very strong research training provision, and this falls through over a number of different areas. So when you're pursuing your PhD, it is about producing that thesis, it is about having a scholarly specialism, but it's also about becoming a competent researcher at the end of it. And so as part of that, we're committed to helping you with that. So within our doctoral school, uh, we will run a number of different courses and workshops that are specifically for research students. So this will include things like um, research and thesis writing, uh, generic methods and te um, techniques for data collection and analysis, research integrity and management, um, and academic publication and presentation. We also have a number of what we call MOOCs, which are massive open online courses. Um, and within that, we also have one called um, Understanding Research Methods. This course was um, developedly joint, um, sorry, developed jointly by SOAS and the University of London. Um, and it was also nominated um, for the Guardian University Award. Um, and you can actually already take that MOOC if you want to um, through our MOOC page on our website, which is just www.soas.ac.uk forward slash MOOC. Um, and you'll be able to see those. And we also do have one-to-one -one consultations by apartment, uh, by department with the um, doctoral store. So in terms of the other areas, we do also have the Careers Advisory Service, which has one-to-one 30-minute -one consultations, which can um, look at career planning, CVs, applications, and mock interviews. Um, we also have uh, the PGR workshops, which include academic career planning, academic um, applications and CVs, ap academic planning beyond academia, non-academic applications and CVs, um, academic and non-academic interview skills, networking skills and presentation skills. We have events that are run particularly for our doctoral students, such as our Academic Careers Day and our research outside of academic um, and other PhD areas um, events as well. And then we also have our um, SOAS careers, which are for all of our students, um, no matter which programmes they're in, and those are run with employers and alumni. Uh, we also have um, our former learning um, and teaching development um, department who will look at professional development in higher education, um, which is accredited. We also run a number of study skills workshops which are open to all students and those again would include things like reading and note taking, avoiding plagiarism, referencing issues and critical thinking. And I think that's really important, particularly um, if you are coming from a different educational background. So say you're coming from another country, the referencing may be very different um, to what you're used to. So again, it's really key to have those um, skill sets. And then again, if you are an international student and in particular, if you're coming from a background where you um, are not from an English language background, we also do have our in-sessional academic English support. Um, which is at all levels and free of charge. And that again, includes things like research reading, uh, preparing and writing dissertations, grammar improvement and seminar skills. Um, and arguably, even if you are a student whose native language is English, but you think you would like a little bit more help in those areas, you can also access that. So then we have the library and the IT facilities. Um, and this is just to really give you an idea of the scope of what we offer within our library um, as a national research library. So in terms of that library, we have subject librarians um, and these are available to all our research students and you're encouraged to go 
to the subject librarians and um, have one to one training sessions, but also liaise with them throughout the year. They are amazing at finding um, different text and resources for you um, that you probably wouldn't be able to find on your own, um, particularly in the last two years with COVID, we have found that all of our students, not just our research students, have leaned greatly on our subject librarians, uh, where maybe coming into um, campus has been an issue or maybe where they want to use more kind of online journals. Um, we also have the interlibrary loans and access to other libraries. So the interlibrary loans are from the British Library and they are free for all of our postgraduate students. And you also have access to and borrow books from 160 different academic libraries um, under the access scheme. So um, you'll be able to find more details of that on our website. Um, in terms of ebooks and e-journals, the library provides access to over um, 100,000 ebooks and 40,000 e-journals. Um, we have specialist databases. Um, the library provides you with access to 70 plus specialist databases, which include bibliographies, abstracts, and um, indexes. Um, the literature searching, legal databases, financial databases, news databases, so really anything you need. And we also have a number of resources in different languages, in particular Chinese, Japanese and Korean. We have the archives and the special collections, and these are a unique collection of archives, manuscripts and rare books from Africa, Asia and the Middle East, um, and they are accessible in the special collections reading room um, on our level F. Um, and I should say that we have the largest collection of East Asian um, literature and one of the largest collections in the world of Middle Eastern um, literature uh, within our library, which obviously again feeds back to the areas in which we focus in on. And then lastly, we have a lot of training sessions um, which run on a number of different areas, but include things like referencing uh, manual management tools, uh, which you would use both in our library, but also maybe in other libraries afterwards. So then we come on to the Bloomsbury Postgraduate Skills Network, which again offers a wide range of training courses for research students across different institutions and the participating institutions are all listed here. Um, and then we also have the doctoral training centers and other opportunities um, as part of other networks that we have as well. And those are, will all be listed on the website as well. So it basically shows you that though you are a research student at SOAS, you have a lot of links and a lot of networks um, both within the UK, particularly in London, but also across the world. So in terms of um, ways in which you can come to us, um, there are a few different ways in which you can come to us. Um, most students would come as a full PhD student, but you also might want to think about coming as a visiting research student. So this is designed for students who are already embarking on doctoral research in their home university, but wish to take advantage of our unique resources. Um, so applicants wishing to undertake this um, would need to register for this. Um, and normally you need to um, have some backing from your home institution to show that they are happy for you to come to an, um, another institution for a period of time. Um, and you will not be formally assessed um, through your work with us. Um, and will not be awarded a qualification. This is more to allow you to um, complete that dissertation, to complete that thesis um, back with your home institution, but just give you um, more access um, and more exposure to different academics around the world. So you can enroll for one term or two terms or three terms, um, and it's just one academic year only. And it's the same application process to our MPhil and our PhD programs, and you can find that all on our website. In terms of entry requirements for the full PhD programmes, um, our minimum entry requirements for applying for a PhD would be a good UK master's degree or an equivalent overseas um, degree. So you will find on our website that we do have country specific entry requirements, which will allow you to um, see if your particular degree, if you're studying outside of the UK, does meet our entry requirements. Um, and in some cases, you would need prior knowledge of a language um, depending on what you're planning to do your um, studies in. And some departments might also have specific entry requirements on their programme, which will be listed on their department pages um, at the SOAS website. So um, I would say examples of this would be if you were doing a PhD programme within our um, economics department, um, they will need you to have some economics background in order to be able to do that. Um, and again, if you were gonna come into some of our finance programmes, again, there would be the thought that you would have that relevant background. But again, we're looking for a relevant background in all of the students who come to us as a PhD student. 
So in terms of what you need to include in your application, uh, the application is only considered once the following has been provided. So you do need to provide all of this for it to be considered. Until you've provided this document, uh, documents, we will have your application and it will sit there until we've seen all of this. So it is important to make sure that you get as much information through to us um, at the time of applying or follow up with the relevant information. So in terms of the information you'd need, uh, we need the formal application form, uh, which can be found on our website, a supporting personal statement. So um, why you want to do this particular piece of research, um, what, why you want to do it at SOAS, um, what skill sets and background you think you have that make you suitable for this, um, and really to showcase how much you know about SOAS as opposed to necessarily how much you know about the subject area that you're taking. I mean, obviously we want you to have the relevant background, but we don't expect you to know everything about a particular piece of um, research you're doing because you haven't completed it yet. And research is an ongoing thing that does change as you do it, but we need to see kind of your commitment and your interest in that and really how you think SOAS can help you with that. Uh, we also look for an up-to-date CV or resume. So again, if you've done any, um, research before, you've been a research assistant, you've worked in research centres, um, or within your studies you were part of a research group, again it's important to list that, as well as any um, non-academic background that you might have that you think is suitable. Then we do need a research proposal, um, so in the UK um, we do look at students to drive their own research, to have their own research proposal, and to have thought about this in quite some depth. In other countries around the world, in some cases, you would be admitted to a research group and possibly given a research area that you would undertake. Um, that isn't the case in the UK. You have to propose um, your research yourself. And then we do need full academic transcripts of your college and university studies to date with official translations from your institution or a recognised translator if they're not in English. And with this, I should say this as is exactly that. It's your full transcripts to date. If you are still completing a programme and so you don't have your final transcripts, you just need to provide what you do have. And then the offer would be made um, on, as on a conditional basis with your final transcripts um, hitting a certain level. In terms of copies of your degree certificates, again, we would need those to be official translations from your institution or a recognised translator, if not in English. Um, and again, we'd only need the copies of the degree certificates for the programmes that you've actually completed. Uh, we will ask you for those afterwards if you are complete, if you're still in the process of completing it. And we do bear in mind that some um, institutions might produce their degree certificates a little bit later. So in some cases, we also accept provisional certs. Um, we also then would need evidence of your English language proficiency or an intent to take a recognised English language test. So again, if you were thinking, I want to complete my studies first and then I'll do my English language test. That's fine. You just have to let us know. And that would be part of the um, conditional offer that we make to you. And then we need one reference, but this must be confidentially submitted by your referee. So um, whoever you nominate must send that into us confidentially rather than through you. Um, and the doctoral school team will check that all the required documents have been provided um, and that your reference is acceptable and meets our entry requirements in the initial assessment. And then it will go to um, an academic for their review as well. So again, when you're looking at studying um, a PhD with us, it is really important that you do that front work in terms of researching who our staff are and how they might be um, the right person to supervise you. And it's often quite good to have that initial conversation with them uh, through email. All of our academic staff have profiles on the website and all of their email addresses are listed on the website. So it's about reaching out to them. In the first stage, I would say reach out to them with your general idea. It doesn't have to be your full research proposal to kind of get that initial conversation going with them, but you will need that final research proposal for the actual application that you put into us. So in terms of the personal statement, as I said, this should explain your motivation to applying to SOAS in your chosen programme. It's useful here for you to outline your skills and experiences that will be relevant to you at your time at SOAS and how you perform on a doctoral researcher um, at the school. And it should be a minimum length of one page. Um, in terms of the research proposal, this must be a minimum of 1,000 to 2,000 words and include an outline of your proposed research topic, an outline of your proposed research method, um, an outline of contingency plan and include a one page preliminary bio 
uh, bibliography of the source materials you intend to use. Um, it's also often beneficial uh, for you to make contact, as I say, with the academic staff who shares your interest prior to submitting your application. They will be able to give you, again, some um, tips, some um, different resources that they think you might look into. And one thing I would say with this is that in the UK, our academic community um, is very much um, a close-knit community. So you may find that the academic you reach out to at SOAS says, I actually don't think I would be the right person for you. Um, it could be that they are already supervising a number of other students. It could be that their particular focus isn't quite the same as yours. And they may suggest somebody else at SOAS who would be better placed. Um, or they may also um, suggest somebody who's not at SOAS, who's at another institution uh, within the UK, because all of our academics do tend to know each other quite well and do work across different um, universities in various different research groups. So in terms of the timeline, applications are open already. Um, and then in terms of when you make applications, they're open from now and they will stay open uh, till the 15th of June, 2022. Uh, we do have January um, entry applications. Um, and so obviously uh, they do have a shorter deadline, um, but they would have already been put in at this point. And then we always have April entry applications. So it depends when you're looking to come into us. Um, and some of them are for the visiting research um, students only. So the main one is the top one for all PhD students. Um, and then the standard response time um, for a complete application is about five to eight weeks. But during that five to eight weeks, you would also be um, having some communication with the academic staff that you've already reached out to. So it's not sort of five to eight weeks where you don't hear anything. It's five to eight weeks where we expect you to be having some conversations with academic staff as well. Um, and then in terms of the offer that you're made, again, that will depend on the information that you have submitted or if you have already completed your program um, that you're currently undertaking. If you haven't completed the program that you're currently undertaking, that offer will be conditional and will be based on when you advise us that you are getting your final results. Um, if you have already finished all of your qualifications, then that should be an unconditional unless you have an English language requirement, which would obviously mean that it is to conditional until you get that. And then once you are unconditional and once you have a firm status with us, you can begin the CAS and visa process um, for international students. Um, and that is an online um, form which you can request six months before the program start date. And it takes about five to 10 working days for us to turn around those requests. Sometimes it is a little bit um, longer in the busier periods. So particularly once we reach um, kind of August um, time, it is quite busy at that time. So if you can avoid um, putting your application or your request for your CAS in at that point, I would do. Um, I would try and put it in early if you can. So then just quickly to touch on English language um, requirements, we do have English language requirements for our postgraduate programmes, um, and we have listed them all here. As I say, you could have taken your English language test when you apply, or you could have an intent to take it later. It's just obviously good for you to bear in mind any turnaround times with that and any offer times and visa processing times. The in-sessional options we run are free of charge um, and we will indicate to you if we feel that you need those in-sessional options um, and again that is all listed on our website but again if you feel even if you meet our um, requirements but you think you want just a little bit more help you can have access to that and then we do run a four and eight week pre-sessional English language course which you can again take if you don't meet any of our top line entry requirements into the um, PhD programme. Um, so again, this just talks a little bit more about the courses that we offer, um, as well as having our four and um, eight week courses, we do have longer courses, so if you are thinking a bit um, that you need more help, we do have our English language and academic studies programs, which can run um, for around kind of three months or so, um, but obviously you'll need to think about the turnaround time in order to do that, um, and it might be best to sit um, an English language test first to see what your English language level is. Um, a lot of students worry about their English language level and then take a test and it actually comes out better than they think. So it's a really good idea to try and do that to know where you are um, as you're applying and which of our in-sessional, pre-sessional um, programmes might be of help to you as well. 
So in terms of tuition fees, um, these are the fees that we have currently. So for our home students, it's 4,486. For our overseas students, it will be uh, 20,000. Um, in terms of funding, our home students are eligible for non-means tested loans from student finance. And for our overseas students, um, we have a number of different loans um, that we work with in terms of overseas um, loans providers. Um, and that can all be found on our website as well. In terms of funding a, um, funding a PhD and what scholarships you might have open to you, PhDs in the UK are mostly self-funded. Um, so that is a difference to other countries around the world. Um, and I know that is something students do worry about. Um, but it, unfortunately, that is the case in the UK in that most of our um, PhD students are self-funded. However, there are various different grants that you could look at taking. Um, and so we've listed them all on our website and you can go to this link for more details. Um, and also we do have a number of external funding opportunities um, for international students, um, such as the Commonwealth Scholarships, um, the Marshall Scholarships, the Wellcome Trust. Um, and there's various different ministries and government funding um, that our students take advantage of as well. So lastly, we'd move on to our open events, and these are really great events if you can um, join them just to find a bit out a bit more about the academics, about the departments um, and about the university itself. So we do have a postgraduate open evening happening on the 17th of November, um, which will be in person. And then we also have an online open day on the 24th of November. Uh, we'll have another one on the 23rd of February in person. Um, and then we also have our Global Challenges Forum, which isn't so much an open day, but it's a really great event. Um, and it takes all of our departments together and we talk about um, key issues affecting the world today. So again, it can be a really great way to experience more of what SOAS has to offer in terms of its academics, its um, kind of impact on the world around us. Um, and then lastly, we do have a postgraduate taster day, which will be on the 16th of March and online, and that will be open to anybody who's already applied to us. And so you can register your interest um, for these events on our website um, and find out more details on the website too. So then I'll just open up to any questions that you might have. I can see that there's a couple of um, comments in the chat box. Uh, so maybe uh, we can have a look at those now. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen just so I can see all of you, because at the moment I can't see anybody, so um, it might be more helpful that way. So I hope that that wasn't too much information thrown at you, um, though it is a big area to cover and there's lots to think about when you're thinking about doing a PhD um, anywhere, whether it be um, in the UK um, or more internationally, and then also at an individual universities. So that is something to consider. So I'm just going to go through um, the questions that have been put in the chat now um, and see if um, see what we can see. So is it possible to pursue a part time PhD remotely in case someone is unable to be in London full time? Um, there are some opportunities to study a PhD remotely. Um, however, we would expect students to come to the UK for a period of time, um, usually at the start of your um, PhD. Um, so that those initial discussions that you're having um, with the academic supervisors are there, but also if you need to take any of the initial classes that we think would be relevant to your, um, to your particular piece of research, you can also undertake those. And also to really fully engage with a number of the um, training and um, development programmes we have. Um, we do have some students who start their PhD with us um, in person, but then men, may spend a period of time um, actually overseas um, or doing field work. And so during that time, they might liaise with their supervisor on a more remote basis um, and via email and via Zoom um, and via all of these great um, accessible options that we have. But we would say that you need to have thought about being based at SOAS for a good amount of time. Um, and so it might mean being there at the start and then coming back at the end when you're writing up. Um, and what we'd also want to know is if you weren't going to be based with us, what access would you have to various different facilities that you would need? So again, what access do you have to libraries? What access do you have to research centres? You know, um, is there another institution that possibly you might be doing your PhD with? So these are all things that we would need to consider uh, when looking at whether you can be remote um, for your research. Okay, and then I can see um, that 
we've got your um, pursuing a distance learning MSc at SOAS at the moment. Will this be considered the same merit as an on-campus um, MRes degree? Uh, so yes, in for SOAS, any of the programs that we teach online are fully recognised as the same level as an MA, MSc in person. Um, the, the difference with the online programmes as opposed to remote learning or as opposed to being on campus is really just the pedagogy in which we teach and um, the access and resources in which you have. And we've designed them very, very, very carefully over the years. We have over 20 years experience um, in offering online programmes. And the online programs that we offer are very, very well regarded. Um, in fact, a number of the online programs that we offer were born out of um, requests from various different government bodies, uh, various different leaders in industry saying, we'd actually like to provide our staff with more areas for development. Um, and we'd like you to help us with that. So um, they are very rigorous degrees. Um, your degree transcript won't even say, um, distance learning on it. Um, but yeah, we believe at SOAS that they are the same level. Obviously, it depends where you've studied at. If you're not at SOAS, I know you are, but um, if others are out there and they've studied an online degree um, and it's not at SOAS, we just look at where you've taken your online degree and what the, um, the options are there. But it is a growing area. And I think through COVID, we've seen that, you know, I would say a number of government bodies previously, previous to COVID, um, hadn't recognised all online programmes. They'd recognised particular ones that they know a lot about, um, but they hadn't recognised all of them. I think coming out of COVID, if there's anything good to be taken out of COVID, um, it would be that online learning does have a little bit more of a, um, you know, a place, um, I think now, because we've seen how so many universities across the world had to switch to that area and they're still providing very, very strong programmes for their students. So I hope that answers that. Um, then it, there's another question that says, I'm about to finish my master's. I don't really like my research topic here. I have not considered my PhD topic yet. What should I do? So um, in order to undertake a, a PhD program in the UK um, and particularly at SOAS, you are going to need to think about forming that research idea. And so you really are going to need to put some thought into it. Um, I mean, I would go back through your program. I mean, it might be that your current dissertation topic that, you're, that you've set yourself on isn't what you want to do long term. Um, maybe you found other areas that have come up during your studies that you think you have a vested interest in, or maybe just you're affected by what's happening in the world at the moment. So it would be important to think about a um, PhD topic that you are committed to and that you do have a vested interest in. It's gonna be um, at least three years of your um, life uh, in terms of this study. So you, it needs to be something you're committed to. So I would say to try and just explore all of the areas that you've currently studied and that you think you found interesting and maybe go on to lots of different websites I like go on to our website and you can see all of the classes that we teach um, it usually gives you a description of each of the modules um, so those would be called classes in other places um, that we offer and it kind of really gives you an in-depth description of that and some um, reading resources so it's really just going to be a case of reading round and really trying to find something that you do have that vested interest in um, and so it might be that it, you need to take a year out as well from um, your studies. So after you finish your master's, it might mean that you do have to take a year and maybe work in a few different fields and see kind of what interests you rather than coming directly onto a PhD program. Um, but yeah, all I'd say is you need to have, you know, you re really need to be committed to it. Um, and it's not a problem to change from what you looked at in your master's into what you're looking at in your PhD, as long as there's still a connection there and as long as we feel that you would still have the right background knowledge for that. Um, so then just moving on to the next questions, we've got um, how much input can a potential supervisor have on shaping your research idea? Um, so they can have a lot of input. So it might be that you come with a very formulated idea and you, you know exactly what you want to do and you've thought about how you're going to do it. You've thought about your research methods. You've thought about the ethical considerations. You've thought about, you've done a lot of reading about other research that's been done that's kind of on the periphery to yours. So you're not um, basically repeating research that's already been done. You're adding something new. You're, you know, you're, you're really providing a new perspective on something 
um, but you've done that kind of read around. Um, and so then what they do is they might say, okay, well, based on what you've said and based on the reading you've done, you might also want to consider this person or this research center. And um, they will help you to shape that. The, the initial application, you do have to have a research proposal, but I'm going to be honest with you now, if most of our PhD students looked back on their initial research proposal that they put in when they applied to us at the end of their research piece, there will be many, many, many differences within that. And during the time that you're with us, there will be very many kind of changes to your research that happens. And that those changes will happen as other research becomes available and gets published. It will happen as issues around the world change because in terms of SOAS, our, our focus is on what is happening here and now, as well as what's happened historically. Um, so that is gonna change and they are gonna help you to um, shape that idea. Um, they won't ever turn the page for you. So we do have an independent learning style um, and they won't ever give you the answers, but they're definitely going to, you know, question you a lot and prod you and send you in lots of different directions that they think is only going to help to make your application and make your end PhD stronger. And in the UK, when you take a PhD, um, you do have an external um, process for vetting your PhD. So they also want to help you with that because they want to make sure that whatever you do in your PhD is going to stand up to that kind of vetting process. Um, okay, if you're currently undertaking your second master's programme, can you gain an unconditional offer based on the results of your first master's programme? Yes, you can if, if that is in the relevant area. If you are taking a second master's program that's more relevant to the subject you'll take, we might also say we'd also like to see a final grade of this, um, but it's not always necessary. So yeah, it can be taken from your first master's and your second master's can just be there to, again, raise your profile. Uh, can we directly contact the teacher of our respective department before applying? So yes, um, I think I covered that in the presentation, but yes, I, we would suggest you do that. So, all of our departments will have profiles for all of our academic staff, and it gives you a really in-depth understanding of who they are, what they teach, what they've researched on, where they've worked, and most importantly, their email addresses. So it's a good idea to write out to them. Um, I find we do get a number of what we call cold PhD applications, where a PhD student hasn't spoken to an academic supervisor. And it's not to say that those PhD applications don't go anywhere. Some students do end up coming to us from those, but then there's a lot more work that happens in the interim. So it actually takes longer to process those applications because we first need to establish who, where, what, when, and why. So if you can do that first, and I think, you know, if you're coming onto a research degree, it's good to do the research in a way, even though that might sound kind of cheesy to say, but, you know, um, I do think it's about making sure that we have the right background for you. I mean, we have excellent departments, but it's not to say that they will cover every single area of every single subject um, and so it's it's worthwhile doing that initial research and as I said they may well send you to somebody else at SOAS and say look actually I think this person is much better for you in terms of what they um, have done before their publications their teaching what they're involved in currently um, or it could just be that we don't have anybody in your particular area but we still think that research is really vital to happen and so we send you to somebody else in the UK or possibly elsewhere as well. Because when you think about research, you've got to think about it as a cycle. So whatever research you want to do, if we can't take on at SOAS, it's not to say that it isn't an important piece of research. And it's not to say that it won't actually end up circling back around to someone later at SOAS than doing a um, related piece of research. So that's really important. Um, I'll just take a couple more questions. And I think then actually we have a hand raised. Actually, let's go to uh, Mustafa if you'd like to raise your question. Hi, Kim. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad to see you. It's been like a year since we had like making like this for postgraduates, now for the PhD. <laughs> yeah, so I finished already my master's degree at SOAS and I'm looking forward for a PhD. I have like a couple of questions. The first one, you've mentioned that if you have a research experience, you can mention it in personal statement. But if I don't have like a research experience, but like program management in different countries, will be the, will, will be like, you know, what will it have like a wealth or like you know something with my application and the second question is about the studentship not the scholarship do you have studentship for international students who would like to do their phd at sawas and the third 
one is about how SOAS will help the students, PhD students, in publishing their articles in high standard journals. Thank you very much. Okay, great, great question. So in terms of um, background, it doesn't just have to be research experience that you have, it can also be any um, work experience that you have that's in the relevant areas. Um, so yes, include any kind of roles that you've had previously. Um, as I say, SOAS is a university of practitioners in the field as well as academics. So we do say that that has as much importance um, to a student doing a PhD as their research background as well. And bear in mind that in doing a, a master's program and in most cases an undergraduate program in the UK, but also um, possibly elsewhere around the world, you will have done a little bit of research within your previous programs as well as part of any sort of dissertations or um, research projects you would have done. And we do include that in there too. So do you think about including that in? Um, in terms of the studentships, um, we do have a, um, every year we do have studentships, which are, they are included within our scholarships, um, but they are for students on research programs. Um, in most cases, those would be um, fully funded for tuition fees and then um, assistance with your cost of living. So it might not cover your full cost of living, but would cover a kind of a, a healthy amount towards that. Each year, um, it does differ on how many of those we give out and they are very, very, very competitive. So by all means, I think students should be applying to the studentship, um, but also to make sure that they've thought about maybe some other avenues of funding that they might be able to use so that if you are unsuccessful in the scholarship, it doesn't mean that you, you don't have anything at the last moment um, to put in there. So I would say to make sure that as well as applying for the studentships that you are thinking about other ways to fund your degree. And then lastly, with the publications question. So yes, in terms of um, having your work published, um, we have lots of different networks that we have at SOAS. Um, some will be at the department level, some will be at the academic level, so that particular supervisor, and some are more um, across the whole institution and also with the various different networks in which we work with. And you will have seen some of that on the presentation. Um, and as I say, we're recording this so I can, we'll send the presentation around to everybody, which will have all the links so that you can explore that um, on our pages, but I'll also get the links put into um, the chat here for you. So there's definitely a lot of, um, there's a lot of assistance with that. Um, and, you know, our, our own reach is very, very strong. Um, and so there's a lot that you can do through our channels first and then publish it after that. So definitely um, it would be something that you should be liaising with the academic staff with throughout your program and also the department with, and possibly joining a number of our research centers. So your work might also overlap with something that we're doing within our research center. And again, through that added um, support with them, you could get your work into a number of different publications. So hopefully that's answered um, your questions. So thank you for those, they were great questions. I'll just quickly um, just scroll through because I think there were a few more questions um, that came up. So um, I think you've said here getting, there's a question that says getting access to supervisors is always challenging. How do you plan on providing the linkage? So in terms of um, supervisors, as I say, it's, it's worth that initial email that you send out to them in terms of asking them if they would be the right supervisor for you or showing your interest in them. Um, sometimes you do have to send a couple of emails. It depends. Um, obviously, all of our uh, supervisors are also academic staff teaching on our programmes, doing their own research um, and also looking at the provision that we have um, for students every year. But they are they are they do try and answer their emails as quickly as possible. Um, some of them are, are going to be on study leave. So it might be that when you have contacted them, they're actually planning to be on study leave for that next period. So um, they may pass it on to another member of the team. You can also copy in the academic, con uh, sorry, the admin contacts in each of the um, subject areas and they'll be able to follow that up with you. Um, but I definitely think um, just emailing out in the first instance is, is the main thing. And then once you are actually with us, so once you're a research student with us, um, access to your supervisors should not be a problem at all. Um, that is why we limit how many students they can take on in any given year so that you know that you have the appropriate amount of time with them. Um, obviously, in the last two years, it's been made a little bit more difficult um, through COVID. So they've been doing more remote um, 
uh, contact with our students, but they do set you a plan at the start. Um, and it is different for every student. So some student meets with their academic supervisor at least once a week, if not more. Some will meet with them uh, once every two weeks. Some might meet with them a little bit less than that, depending on their own needs. Um, but they will be wanting to have some sort of communication with you on a regular basis. So whether it's via emails, whether it's via a Zoom, whether it's via an in-person appointment. So um, I would say once you're in our programs, very strong. Um, obviously coming into our programs, it will depend on what the academic staff is doing um, at that particular time. And what I also would recommend is it's quite a good idea to try and contact three academic members of staff that you think are related to your area. And it's so as again, you will probably find that you're more able to find that because all of our subject areas, again, are interconnected and interrelated with each other. So often you'll find that there might be three possible supervisors for you. There might be um, that you're swayed more to one than the others because of their background, but it's important to write out to all of them. Um, and we do sometimes have you know, more than one supervisor. In fact, we, we always tend to have more than one supervisor, but one tends to be your primary supervisor. Um, so you should be able to have good contact with them. Um, so then there are a few questions about are there provisions for PhD applicants with families? Um, in terms of PhD applicants with families, um, we can help you with your visa application um, for dependents and we do also have some access to some accommodation, which is more of a family accommodation. However, those are very, very um, oversubscribed. So again, it's important to let us know of what you might need early on. And it's more likely that you would have private accommodation rather than university accommodation. Um, are there opportunities for PhD students to work uh, throughout the university period? Yes, you can work throughout your time with us. Um, as in, um, UK student, you can work the hours that you want to work, though we always say to obviously keep in mind that your primary goal would be your PhD. And ideally, we want you to finish that within three years with six months writing up. Some students do extend over a period of time, but we do have to consider that in terms of how many students we're supervising at any one time. Um, so just do have a think about that in terms of your workload. Um, and then as an international student, you are allowed to work up to 20 hours per week during term time and full-time hours during non-term time. But again, I would say, you know, a research is a, a huge piece of work for you to be undertaking. Um, and you do want to leave yourself um, options to take part in all the additional events that happen at SOAS that also might impact on your research. So we do a lot of guest lectures, book signings, um, film screenings, um, networking events. Um, and you would want to make sure that you have time to attend all of those too. So I, I actually say it would be better um, particularly for international students to start off with maybe 10 to 15 hours of work per week and then see how they go from there. Um, let me see if there are any more questions. If we have a research interest, can the professors help us frame our research? So I think, yeah, I've gone um, back through that before, but yes, they definitely will. So, I mean, any student who comes in, particularly those, even those who have um, a really strong idea and those who have like a bit more of a, um, an open idea during that application process, they'll help you to frame that and they'll help you to kind of hone in on, on what they think is feasible also in the time frame and the resources that you have. But even throughout your PhD, um, they will be there kind of there to support you, um, there to help you in terms of learning about different areas. And so do all of the um, research um, kind of development and training um, practices that we have, because all of that is there to help you with your particular piece of research, but also to help you develop your skill sets more widely as a researcher for what you might want to go on to in the future. Um, so do, again, do we have to be based in London for a PhD? I think I've already answered that to a certain extent, um, that we would expect you to be based with us for a period of time. And obviously, if there's a reason why you wouldn't be um, with us, if, you know, there's a need to do field work in a particular region or area or place um, other than London, then of course we would um, try and help support that as best we can. But there is also a need for you to have that kind of time to bed into your PhD um, and that time to have access to all of the resources and facilities. And if you aren't a SOAS, we just need to know um, how you're going to have res um, resources and access to various different facilities. Um, and I think maybe one thing that would kind of also 
um, cross over into that area that maybe we haven't touched on to a certain extent at the moment is ethics. So um, at SOAS, we do have a very strong policy um, in terms of ethics um, of research. And that's everything from, you know, in terms of looking at the overall ethics of your research and the methodology that you're using and who you are researching and who is involved in that and what um, permissions and access they give you and what safety is there for those people, but also your safety. So if you are planning on doing field work and you're going somewhere, we need to know that a risk assessment has been done. We need to know that there are, you know, um, that you have various different access to help when you need it. Um, many of our students are looking at a number of um, research pieces um, in areas of conflict. I mean, it's a very um, it's a very clear area within our programs and across many of our programs. And so with that, if they are planning to go to areas where there has been conflict, we do need to know that they are going to be safe and secure. And so, again, that's something that kind of factors into whether you're going to be at the campus or away from the campus and where you will be. Um, okay, let me see. Uh, Um, let me see if there's any further questions. I think there's been quite a few coming through. So we'll get through as many as we can. We've probably got another five minutes and then um, unfortunately we'll have to end the session. But I will also um, try and make sure that all of the questions that are raised in this session um, that we can come back to you with them um, at some point as well. So let me just have a quick look. I think there's a few more that I can probably get to in the time. So um, I think this question about how many seats will there be in cultural, um, literatures, literary and um, post-colonial studies. So it's not that there's a certain amount of seats um, in each department. It would be that supervisors themselves can only supervise a certain amount of students at any one time. Um, and that is, as I say, just to protect and make sure that you have access to them as much as you need access to them. So there's not a quota per department but it's more just about who the academic staff are already um, supervising um, from previous years and who they'll be supervising further. So the important thing is to get your application in as early as you can. And I think that will help you in many respects. One, obviously, because it means that we will get your application earlier. And if they maybe haven't said yes to other students to supervise and yours is in line with what they're doing, they may say yes to you. But also, the earlier you put your application in, the more that you have time to really understand what facilities, what academic staff we have to support you and for us to understand more about the piece of research you want to do. And one other aspect of it is that building of communication with your academic supervisor. This is three years that you're going to spend of your life and it's a very close relationship that you would need to have with them. And sometimes you have just the right academic background and they have just the right academic background, but still the communication isn't quite there. So the longer, the earlier you apply, the longer they have to build that communication with you and build that working style with you um, as you progress through, um, through to actually coming onto your PhD and then in your PhD. So yes, PhDs are three years in duration with normally six months writing up. So it's three years, six months, but can be extended depending on why you need to extend it. Um, and I think the team have been answering a few of your other questions as well. So I think we've probably got to, oh, I think there's one more. Um, does the opportunity exist to pursue a part-time PhD in collaboration with a company that is not yet, I guess, working with us? I mean, you can always do collaborations with outside organizations and we encourage students to build networks um, through our own resources, but also networks that they're able to build themselves. I mean, that's why we give you a lot of those networking and training sessions. So definitely that's possible to do it. And we do allow part-time PhDs. Um, however, part-time PhDs aren't available at the moment for our international students. So it would only be our home students who are able to do the part-time PhD. And the only other thing to think about with doing a part-time PhD is that um, obviously in terms of the tuition fees, they are lower. Um, per year, but then you have more years and you're going to have more living costs. So I think it's just something to bear in mind with that. Um, and also this collaboration you have with an um, external company or organization 
how much of that time do you need to uh, dedicate to them and how much commitment do you need to give them? So these are all important things um, to think about. So hopefully that's been helpful to you all. Thank you all for your great questions. Um, thank you all for coming along today. Um, we will be sending out this recording to you. Um, I hope that I didn't throw too much information at you at one point. Um, and do feel free to come along to our um, online and in-person, if you can come in person um, events. I think you'll learn more about the university that way and you will have access to the academic staff. So our academic staff, um, both um, interact on the um, virtual open days and also in the um, in-person open evenings. So they normally have a desk where you can go talk to them and chat to them and network. And we'll also do panel styles where we'll have a range of different academics from different backgrounds, maybe talking to one um, particular issue or area. Um, so definitely, I think they are really great for you to um, access and do go on our website and, and do kind of as I say, unfortunately, do the research to do the research. Um, so hopefully that's been helpful. I thank you all for your time. Sorry, we've run a little bit over. Um, and um, I hope to see you sometime on campus um, or at any of our events. Thank you, everybody.